Welcome to the Side Chat Podcast. This week we are going to discuss bow fighters. What you're seeing on the screen is not a bow fighter, that is in fact a Beaufort. But these two planes are much closer related than most of you probably know, in case you don't know anything about bow fighters. It is my favorite, well not my favorite, but it's one of my favorite planes from World War II, and it's definitely one of my favorite planes in game. Uh, and I, I have a confession to make when I first started playing War Thunder, I kind of abused the living crap out of that plane because it had a really sketchy flight model for a uh, twin engine fighter, plus it had the damage model of a uh, Sherman tank. So as you can see there, when I first started playing realistic, 92 kills, 31 deaths, and uh, and then I since kind of left that. That's how I first started playing in arcade, 300 kills, 90 deaths, so I've had my fair share in the Mark 6C. Um, I'm going to start out with the development of the Bowfighter and then discuss some of the variants and then the different roles and how it affected history. Um, I think it's a pretty fascinating plane. And it's changed a lot more Thunder over the past year from a overpowered menacing beast to almost, for the most part, being non-effective. Um, I don't know where the balance is. It's one of those planes that it's role specific, specific and... Um, most of those planes are kind of left out in the cold war thunder. So, this plane right here, as you see, is called a Beaufort, which is made by Bristol. And then you have the Bowfighter. Why I'm going to show these two planes is because I'm going to hold this from different angles. These are about 90% the same aircraft. And uh, let me get the side view here. Basically, what happened is the, the Beaufort was around for a while. And Bristol decided they weren't commissioned to. They saw that the war was coming, and they wanted to put together a long-range uh, fighter and somewhat of a night fighter, you could say. And then it wound up doing multiple roles from that. So, bow fighter is made up of all metal components, which is one of the reasons it is durable. It first flew in July 17, 1939, so it was an early war plane. Uh, it saw service in August of 1940. It saw time with 50, over 52 RAF squadrons, it's, I think, pretty impressive. And I'm going to talk about some of the early variants, variants that are in the game, but uh, it was a night fighter until 1943, and it lost that role because, well, I'll cover that in a bit, it was just too slow. And the last bow fighter, bow fighter was retired in 1960, so this thing almost saw 20 years of service. Um, typically there's two crew slots on this guy, you have a pilot here, and then in this case you have a gunner here, but in the earlier variants this thing actually had radar for night fighting, and so the radio op radar operator would be back there. And uh, it's, it's a very unique aircraft. Um, typical loadout package is four 20mm cannons right here, and then it usually has some type of other armament or uh, alternate armament on, armament on it. The engines that you see here are Bristol Hercules and they are some of the most complex engines uh, probably ever made. They're actually quite efficient, pretty good engines. There's a lot of variants, so as the Bowfighter got older, it got the more um, improved versions of the Hercules, but sometimes the Hercules wasn't available, and the Bowfighter got uh, kind of what was ever, whatever was laying around that they could fit into it. Um, but the typical package of these engines is about 1,400 horsepower apiece. Uh, top speed on average was 320 miles at 16,000 feet. So not a typically uh, fast aircraft. These engines were supercharged, and uh, the reason why they sit so far in front of the fuselage, kind of like it, it's one of the few planes. There's some other planes in the game, but it wasn't typical that you have the engines so far off the leading edge of the wing, and that was to uh, reduce vibrations. One of the neat things, though, I'll tell about this plane right now, is that with the superchargers and the way the engines were laid up and the Hercules were really quiet from the front, uh, part of that was due to the exhaust and just the way the engine operated, that uh, the Japanese called it whispering death, and there's the stories of you can't hear this plane coming from the front. So it's not whistling death. The Corsair is whistling death. The Bowfighters know it's whispering death, in case you got a little confused there. They, some, there's cases of Japanese, you know, details where they'd just be sitting on top of, or sitting on their cargo ship, or walking on the, you know, deck of a cargo ship at night, and all of a sudden there's 20 millimeters raining from hell, and then you know torpedoes, and you've never heard it coming, and then these things just blast past full bore. Um, I think it's pretty cold. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to cover a bit of the construction now. 
The main fuselage and engine mounts are the primary changes from Mr. Beaufort here. But if you take the Beaufort's tail, the rudder, the elevator, the outside wing, the ailerons, the flaps, the tail boom here, the landing gear, and I think that's it. Maybe there's some other stuff. Uh, the hydraulics are the same. I forgot about that part. They're all pretty much identical. There were some different fittings, but for the most part, the manufacturing process and everything was almost identical. That's one of the reasons I like this plane is that you know it, it kept the production line uh, simple. I mean, for the most part, this was something that was already in production. You just made some changes for the fuselage here and the engine mounts. And uh, and then the variations you see, since there's, you'll see that there's you know the the planes in game go up to March 21. One of the reasons why there's so many variations is just because of parts that were available to build these things. And I'll try to run through those in a bit. Uh, assault action in the desert, uh, British Coastal Command as an interceptor, as a night fighter, in the Pacific Theater. So this thing got around. A little bit about how it flies, and this is one of the problems that uh, as a debate constantly more thunder, and since it kind of got nerfed down to, I guess, respectable manners, it's not so much. This thing used to just out-churn, out-roll uh, 109s, and I, I thought it was funny. It was fun, but... It was actually a pretty well-flying aircraft. It, you know, I'd say it outperformed either on par or a little bit better than most twin-engine fighters at low altitude. The problem is, is you have all the weight in the front here, and then <laughs> it liked to sometimes do front flips. It liked to do ground rolls, and you also had the awesome problem of if you lost an engine, it would like to just roll over and uh, crash. So it wasn't the easiest plane to uh, fly. The other problem with it is that these 20 millimeters actually cause the plane, well, usually when you have recoil and anything, it makes you know the nose rise or the whatever, that's the left back. Well, in this plane, the 20 millimeters will cause the plane to violently dip forward. So later models like the Mark 10, you'll see these uh, sight, these little guns, like you got four here and two on this side, uh, were put in simply to give the pilot an alternate, alternate armament in case he didn't want to fire the four 20 mils underneath. There was about 5,500 of these guys produced. Um, it was all service in England and Australia primarily. It was in the U.S. in small numbers. And then it saw services in kind of smaller countries um, from there. So I'm going to run through real quick on a development of the variants of these guys because I think it's kind of neat. Uh, story and there's some variants that I'm going to skip. Some of this information is actually really hard to find so I've done my best to look through some books, look through the internet, look through some different historical sites. The Australian site went through a Bristol site uh, trying to dig up as much as I can. It's just it's kind of an undocumented mess in a lot of ways. Um, first variant of the bow fighter that saw service to my knowledge was the Mark 1F and Mark 1C. The Mark 1F carried a radar um, it was the only aircraft that they really had that size that could carry the radar that was a fighter. The Hurricanes and Spitfires, even though they were faster, couldn't carry the radar on them. The crappy part, though, was that the Mark 1F was so slow it couldn't catch any of the German bombers. And it just kind of flew around hoping to get lucky and get in, get in their way and get a kill. It took four months of service for it to get a kill in 1940. The Mark 1C went to the Coastal Command, and the main difference between it was it had a 50-gallon fuel tank, which is, it's called a slipper. It was the same thing they used in the Wellington. Uh, the aircraft also had a navigation table and direction finding equipment. Uh, it saw service in 1941 as well, and it also primarily served in the Mediterranean. So it was a anti-submarine, anti-ship uh, guy for the most part. The Mark II F was because, I uh, kind of mentioned the Hercules engine, real quickly, is a pretty hard engine to produce. It has these sleeves in it that uh, move up and down it's hard to maintain, it's hard to produce, but like I said, it's efficient. Uh, they were running out of, at this time, they are running out of Hercules because they wanted him for the Sunderlands. Or, I'm sorry, the Sterlings. They wanted him for the Sterlings, not the Sunderlands, sorry. I have the Sunderland on my mind because of the, it coming out more thunder soon. Sterling. Uh, 447 Mark II Fs were built with the Merlin engine, even though it was less powerful, and that saw service of April 1941. And then you're going to see... 
a bunch of variants that will never make it the game, hopefully, because they didn't even exist. Uh, there was a proposed version of a slimmer bow fighter um, with the newer Hercules engines. That never came to fruition. There's a Mark IV with the same design of a slimmer bow fighter fuselage, but with Merlin engines. So Mark III and IV, you don't need to know about for the most part. So Mark I, Mark II, three and four are non-existent. The Mark V was an experimental version. That might see uh, action in War Thunder. Not really sure. Doesn't really have a purpose in my mind. Uh, there's a turret made by Bolton Paul that was best way I can describe it. It's kind of like the P61 turret that was on the back of the Black Widow. Uh, and I'll show a picture of it on the back of a British plane here. But it was um, it replaced all the wing mounted guns in two of the cannons. So it only had two forward facing 20 millimeters. And it was supposed to be like a night fighter that shot below and up into other aircraft. Uh, two were built, so it actually saw service. But it had awful performance and was abandoned because of it. So, like I said, it saw service as night fighter. It was abandoned, and I believe that was the last time the boat fighter actually saw night service. Or, uh, night fighter service. So, from there, we're going to have the big changes. That's where we have the Mark 6F, which is not in game, but it is a close relative to the Mark 6C that you either love or despise in the game. That was when the Hercules 6 engine was introduced, providing much more uh, horsepower, up to 1,670 horsepower. The new engines allowed heavier loads and increased speeds up to 10 miles in pH. It wasn't more about the speed, it was more about the ability to carry more munitions. So one thing that is not in game is these guys are able to carry bombs either mounted underneath where the torpedo is here or on the wings. Uh, the Vickers K was mounted here with the canopy. I believe this was the first variant of Bowfighter for this to have that. And it had 74 more gallons for increased range. So the Mark 6C here saw service with the Coastal Command, and that's why it has a torpedo here. Uh, had better low alt oh, altitude performance than its friends, and could carry a 18 inch torpedo. I believe that worth under. This is 8. I believe this is the 8. Yeah, 18 inch torpedo, so that's correct. Uh, and replaced the Beaufort as the primary land-based torpedo bomber, so it put this guy out of business for the Coastal Command. Uh, it could also carry bombs, like I said, but they typically didn't because it was a pain in the ass to get rid of this uh, torpedo mount for the bomb mount. And then we have two planes that aren't in game, which are will never come to fruition because it's the Mark 8 and the Mark 9 come up next. And they were set aside for Australian production numbers. They were never used. So we jump to the Mark 10, this guy. And this is kind of what you consider the ultimate bow fighter. This is what the most were produced of. There was 2,200 of these guys produced. 40% um, of that was UK production has really good low altitude, low altitude performance like the Mark 6. The uh, you have the you know this is the first time you'll see it in a game where you have the alternate uh, fire you know the guns on the side for ultimate alternate ammunition to fire. Speak jeez. And it had the ability to drop a torpedo which is I believe in game. We have rockets, we have torpedoes. It could fire 890 pound rockets, it could fire the torpedo. It could hold either two 500 pound bombs right here on its center line, or it could hold two 250s on the wings. And the later variants, which I'll get to later, could hold two 1,000 pounds. So it's kind of missing some of those munitions yet for more thunder. A variant of this, which were modified after the war, called TT Mark 10. These were made for uh, target towing duties. It last flew on May 12, 1960, so that's how you get the 20 years of service date, was these were modified to uh, tow targets behind them. Um, Mark 11 is similar to the 10, but can't carry a torpedo. Like I said, these variants are such little, it's not even worth uh, really noting. The Mark 17 had the newer Hercules engine, but since they couldn't make enough carburetors, it was uh, canceled. But that's where the stronger wing came into play, and the stronger wing was installed on the Mark 10s, and that's how it could carry the 1,000 pound bombs. And then we're going to jump directly to the Mark 21, which is a Mark 10 for the most part. The Mark 21 was an Australian production of the Mark 10. It has a different nose section. I don't know if you can see it. 
Uh, I don't think you can really see in game. Anyway, yeah, you can. You see that bump there is. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's what it'll it for the nose section is that little bump there. It had a different autopilot instead of the uh, six three hundred three British caliber guns. It flipped to the four uh, fifty cal Browning automatics. And 364 of these were built. They first flew in May 26, 1944, which is why you see such a huge battle rating difference, 1.0 battle rating difference. And it used to be like, back in the old 20 tier system, I think it was like, these were tier 4 and 5, or 5 and 6, and these were tier 12 at one point, just because of the late uh, introduction date. Um, Alter nose. This was in service until 1957 with the Aussies. Uh, and then there's a couple other variants I'll mark, mention. There's a Mark 12 that was proposed that had long range drop tanks. I don't know if the Mark 10 ever had this drop tank. I could never find it. Um, and then the Aussies experiment, experimented with a 40 millimeter Bofors cannon variant of the uh, of the bow fighter, and I think that's fucking badass. Um, just to run through a few of the differences of the performance numbers as this thing progressed. The ceiling was typically 25,000 feet for all these variants. Um, starting off the Mark 1, it had 1,500 horsepower, 321 miles an hour at 16,000 feet, range of 1,100 miles. Going to the Mark 2 with the Merlin engines, it was 301 miles an hour at 20,000 feet, so significantly worse uh, performance. Less range as well, 1,000 miles only. Then you get to the Mark 6 with the newer Hercules engine. You have your go from, you know, like I said, almost 670 more horsepower compared to the Mark 2 with a top speed of 333 miles an hour at 15,000 feet. And then the Mark 21 went up to 1,700 horsepower and 323 miles an hour. So it was, the numbers here are slower than the Mark 6. So uh, no matter what variant of the Bowfighter you're going to see, it's going to perform pretty comparably to each other. Um, why this plane was so important, though, for many reasons besides it had one of the highest kills of ships and submarines for the British Coastal Command. Um, this thing was a terror in the sea. It was a terror in Africa doing its ground attacking, uh, you know, capabilities. I, it kind of felt as a night fighter, but where I really love the plane from is the Mark 21 variants and some of the others that went to the Pacific. Um, the whole idea is these things were pretty resilient and packed a lot of punch and the idea was is that it would counterattack any Japanese army it saw, any landing Japanese navy, Japanese ships, uh, Japanese cargo ships, but it was also brilliant because it would drag zeros down to it and then allow the other you know, RAF aircraft to attack the zeros trailing on it. So um, I think it's a pretty neat aircraft. I hope that they add in a few more of the variants. And, uh, I don't know, it's kind of ugly, I think, but for some reason I, uh, I think it's sexy. And real quickly, I like to say that this is actually the reason I got into War Thunders, because I saw a Raba's video, and that's why I kind of, the ode of the Canadian policeman on the side, I actually saw that video, and, uh, that's the first time I heard of War Thunder, was the Canadian policeman bowfighter Mark VI that Raba's was flying. So, I hope you like the path down a little bit of memory lane there. Um... Real quickly, next week, I believe we are going to do a podcast on the U.S. strategic long-range bombers. Um, Kobe, like I said, Kobe and I have some kind of personal attachments to those from family, or past family. And um, we're going to kind of, I know everybody's, at least, there's two sides of it right now. Every Everybody's either abusing the B-17s at this moment, or you, uh, you're either using them or you hate them. And we'll kind of discuss how the B-17s really need a proper home as well in the game. So, uh, fly bow fighter. They're freaking cool. See you next week.